Dr. Ross Walker, I'm so delighted to welcome you to the Ageless by Rescue podcast. Um, welcome. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here, Baha. Thank you. So I had the pleasure of sitting next to you at a launch for Jeunesse, their Life Circulate um, supplement. And I heard you speak and we had so many wonderful conversations around regenerative medicine, cardiovascular health, and we are both deeply passionate about lifespan, but more importantly, health span. Yep. Um, I'm really interested to hear your take on the difference or the complementary nature of a discussion around lifespan, which is longevity, and yep. health span, which is the quality of life that we live in our yep. long in our pursuit for living longer. Well, I think the first point to make is evolutionary wise, we're only designed to function well for 30, 40 years wandering around a jungle with a spear. And then when you hit 50 and the hormones go south, everything wears out pretty quickly in most people. And here's the problem. Many people are spending the last 20 to 30 years of their life in the misery of some chronic illness. And, and so by the time people are hitting 60, they've got some chronic complaint, whether it be obesity, diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, the, com the common ones that people get, then you lead on to the more serious things like heart disease, cancer, cognitive impairment leading on to Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, all our common killers, which all have a very strong genetic basis, but also are related to the fact that we're living well beyond our use-by date, which is about 40. A lot of people don't realise that osteoporosis starts at age 30. 30 is the peak of our life. Sarcopenia, which mo most people don't even know what it is, nor talk about it, sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass. And we need strong muscles to support our bones. So the osteoporosis and sarcopenia go together, start at age 30. If you look at all high-performance athletes, they're not as good in their 30s as they were in their 20s because things are just starting to change from about age 30. So I think we, we really have to look at, at anti-aging. We have to look at what we can do to stop the aging process or slow it down so people aren't spending the last 20 to 30 years of their life in the misery of chronic illness. And that's what health spans about. You, you can live to 80, but have 20 years of, of pretty miserable existence, going to doctor after doctor, taking pill after pill and having procedure after procedure, or you can live to your 80 to 90 to 100 and have a very good quality life. And, and there are many ways to achieve that. One of the things that I loved in speaking with you, I mean, you're an integrative cardio, cardiologist. So, you know, you're a specialist, a, a, an ultra specialist, but that you have such a broad view of vitality, cellular wellness, uh, beauty even um, as part of your interest and, and how you speak to your patients and, and the care that you offer them. Can you tell me a little bit about what integrative cardiology is and how yep. through your work and your books and, and your radio show even, you've combined um, cardiology with the bigger picture? Yeah, well, well to me, good health isn't about swallowing a pill or having a procedure. And you think about that, just one great example here, Baha, is statin therapy to lower your cholesterol. There are so many people that have this delusion that the key to good health is lowering a number in your bloodstream with a pill. So the overweight person goes into the doctor and says, doctor, I've got cholesterol. And the doctor says, I can fix that, Lipitor next. So the guy walks out and goes, oh, phew, I didn't get a lecture about being fat. I'll just take this and eat what I like. That idea is biologic nonsense. And this is where the whole concept of integration comes in. Integrative cardiology or integrative medicine is firstly focusing on the most important thing, which I want to spend a bit of time talking about, which is lifestyle, how we treat ourselves. But then taking the best bits of orthodox medicine, the best bits of complementary medicine, and combining them all together. Or in other words, integration. That's why we're talking about integrative cardiology. But I see so many patients who say, my, uh, the cardiologist I've seen before you didn't even mention all you're saying about lifestyle. So the, the, the most of a preventative conversation I'll have with most standard cardiologists is I'll lose a bit of weight and do some exercise. That's it, if, if it's even mentioned at all. And the most important focus from those people 
is, is to focus on the medications they're on or focus on what procedures are necessary to keep that person healthy. It's just nonsense, absolute nonsense. And here's the key. The five keys of being healthy, and I'll go through those, from the least important to the most important. You cannot be healthy, number one, and have any addiction. So anyone who smokes is sick. I don't care whether you're a 25-year-old who can run a marathon. If you smoke cigarettes, you are ill, and you will get more ill as you get older. Drink too much alcohol. Use illegal drugs. Anyone who does anything along those lines is sick. So number one is to quit all addictions. And I'll, put, I'll tie these all together at the end. Number two is good quality sleep. And, and we're getting increasing conversation around sleep. Seven to eight hours of good quality sleep per night is as good for your body as not smoking. So we really need to focus on the importance of sleep. So many people say, oh, I'm too busy. I've got to only have five or six hours sleep. That's very bad for your health. I so loved you when to... you spoke about that at the event, actually. To me, it, it was so refreshing to hear because all of the research I've ever done on longevity, cellular wellness, anti-aging is that truly sleep is the beauty and longevity tonic that we're all seeking. If we can just do that one part well, we're halfway that, there. Well, and, and here's the problem. Because we are hitting that, that horrible age of 50 where the hormones go south, then your sleep gets more fragmented. You don't sleep as well. The quality of your sleep isn't as good. And so therefore, unless we maintain good sleep hygiene, that will have a, a profound effect on our metabolism. So one of, the, one of the big problems now, the great pandemic of the 21st century is not the coronavirus. It is diabetes, which is the combination of diabetes and obesity. And one of the big factors there is poor quality sleep. So people who get poor quality sleep have a much higher rate of weight gain, diabetes, et cetera. So sleep number two. Number three, following on from that, is nutrition. And nutrition is very easy to talk about, but it's much harder to do. It's called eat less food, eat more natural food. Now, I'm not talking about people walking around being painfully thin. That's not good for you either. But I'm saying we've got to stop this progression to obesity. And, and most people put on the kilos every decade. The, uh, the average weight gain is, is 0.5 to 1 kilo per year. And so often people put on from the age of 40 to 50, 10 kilos. We really have to work on that by eating less food, eating more natural food. And what I, what I talk about there is simple thing, two or three pieces of fruit per day, three to five servings of vegetables, servings about a half a carrot. So it's not a huge amount of vegetables, but three to five servings of vegetables per day. Those two things together have the lowest rate, people who do that have the lowest rates of, of heart disease and cancer in the community. And, and the shocking fact is that less than 10% of people do it just by doing that. Avoid white death. What is white death? Any form of sugar, white bread, pasta, potatoes, rice. I'm not saying don't eat any of those things. I'm saying just don't have them as the center of your food. And then if you want to add on top of that, if you want to little bits of meat, eggs, dairy, chicken, fish, nuts, and olive oil, which is very important, it's called the Mediterranean diet. And in fact, the Mediterranean diet is the only diet that has any long-term mortality, morbidity data. It Can has I interrupt you there? Sorry. What, what are your thoughts? I can't remember what we, I know we talked about it. Do, um, and I know that we both really uh, love the work of Professor David Sinclair and his book, Lifespan. Yep. How do you feel about intermittent fasting? Because again, there is just such a body of work sure. um, speaking to your point precisely that we need to eat less and that yep. intermittent fasting gives us an opportunity to do that in a really easy, free way. What do you say to that as an integrative cardiologist? Well, Baha, I think that's a magnificent point you're making, and I'd like to explore that a little bit. If you think about it, I said right at the start, we were designed to wander around a jungle with a spear for 30, 40 years. That's our evolution. Our evolutionary biology is to be hunter-gatherers. We haven't changed much over the past 10,000 years. And what did they do? They'd see an animal, they'd kill the animal, they'd eat it straight away because there were no prehistoric kelvinators because the animal went off, you don't eat the thing immediately. And when you didn't have that sort of food, that big feast, you just fed off a few nuts and berries off the trees and drank water from the local, local watering hole. So basically, they practiced intermittent fasting. 
So, so they, they would have a big meal when it was available, but it might be two or three days in between big feeds. Where, what do we do? We have breakfast, lunch, dinner, sit in our backsides all day, and we wonder why we put on weight. And we wonder why we get diabetes. It's all very bad for your metabolism. So I, I think people should practice a couple of days a week. You don't need to have a, you don't need to have a, a strict regimen for all this, but a couple of days a week just to, to have days where you don't eat much. And also this time restricted eating is a good idea as well. Don't have breakfast some days. Start eating at 12, have your, your last meal at six. So you have a long fast that day. That will help you lose weight. I, I saw a man the other day, uh, there's just on Monday, who had lost 50 kilos, 50 kilos in three years. I said, how did you do it? And he said, counting calories. So I know that sounds pretty banal, but there is a, a new app called Alfred where you can actually take a picture of the food you eat and it estimates the amount of calories in that food. So instead of looking up how many calories there is in this meal, they, this, app, this app allows you to take the picture and you can see what you're eating. And he said just by estimating his calories, he realised how much unnecessary food he was eating, cut it down to about 1,500 calories a day, which is not much at all, I've got to say, but he's lost 50 kilos and his health has turned around markedly by losing weight. So yes, I agree with intermittent fasting. I think it's a good thing to do, but it's basically just don't eat so much. You, you think about now, one of the solutions to morbid obesity is a mutilating operation on your stomach where they reduce it down to the size of a banana. It's called gastric bypass surgery or gastric reduction surgery. And that stops you from eating so much. <clears throat> There's another way of doing that. It's called don't eat so much. But you know, so so, but that requires discipline. A guy called Napoleon Hill wrote a book in the 1930s called "Think and Grow Rich," and he wasn't just talking about Love money. That book, yeah, he was talking about success in everything. The two great success principles are discipline and perseverance. I wrote a book about 20 years ago called "Diets Don't Work," because you go on a diet like you go on a holiday. What happens when you go on a holiday? You come home. What happens when you go on a diet? You stop. It's not about having a 12-week program or, or doing something for a few weeks or a detox, which we'll get, get on to Shane Warne in a second. But it's not about that. It's about having a program that works for you for the rest of your life that's achievable. And that, that's about making small changes every day. So that's nutrition, number three. Number four is what I believe to be the second best drug on the planet, which is three to five hours every week of moderate exertion. And people say to me, okay, doc, what is the best form of exercise? Very, very simple. The best form of exercise is one you'll keep doing. So just over my left shoulder here is, is my exercise bike. And that's my form of exercise because I had a knee replacement two years ago because I played soccer and squashed till I was 52 and it destroyed my knee. And I, I battled with arthritis in my right knee for about 13 years. So if anyone is good at maths, you figure out how, how old I am. Uh, but now I do a half an hour on that bike every day. I've broken three exercise bikes in, in 13 years from overuse. And I will continue to do that because it suits me. But other people, walking, they've got a dog. They take their dog for a walk. Other people like swimming. Other people like cycling outside. Other people like playing sports. I don't care what you do, but the sweet spot is three to five hours of exercise per week for good health. If you exercise more than that, you don't get any extra benefit. And you do that for your own reasons. And I have no problems with people doing that. Uh, marathons, for example, I've never run one in my life. I think there's a perfectly good bus service. So when <laughs> a marathon is you won't me, see me on a marathon circuit either. Will <laughs> you ever see me on it? But but again, if people want to do that, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if you want to do it for good health, the dose, and it's all about dose, three to five hours a week of moderate exertion, which I believe should be two thirds cardio and a third resistance training. So I do my half an hour a day on the bike. I do about 20 minutes of weights and stretching every day. And, and that reduce now just doing that reduces your risk for heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, depression by 30%. So these are all the markers of youth. So just going back to the what the conversation here is about an ageless lifestyle, health span and lifespan. And yeah. you know, the exercise, even if you just do it purely for, you know, any one of those things that you just listed. It's worth it. 
Oh, absolutely. And, and osteoporosis, 50% drops your blood pressure and you sleep better. There is no pharmaceutical pill known to man that comes anywhere near exercise as a benefit. The only drug better than exercise is a thing called happiness. And people who are happier, people who enjoy their lives, people who get on with the people around them. So, for example, a 75-year study from Harvard University showed the one key to health and happiness is to have someone else in your life who loves and cares for you, who you love and care for. It's better than your damn cholesterol level. So if you do those five things well, those five keys to a healthy life, which I say to all my So patients, the final key is happiness, just happiness, to be yeah. clear. Yeah. So you do those five things well, that's 80% of your management, that reduces your risk for cardiovascular disease by 83% cancer, 70%. And if you take a statin drug to lower your cholesterol, that's about a 20% reduction in one disease, a heart attack. That's it. So what, why people will come in with a big fat gut or a cigarette hanging out of their mouth and say, doctor, I need more of that Lipitor or that Crestor. And I say to them, what's going on in your skull? You've got the real key to good health. But the problem with that, Baha, is it requires discipline and perseverance. And most human beings are, are, are lazy and they don't want to do it. So if I, if I suggest any program to anyone, after 12 months, 50% of people have stopped. The adherence to, to medical programs, integrated programs, is appalling. Now, I see a bucket of people who do follow my advice and nothing ever happens to them. Then I see all the people who can't or won't follow my advice and they whittle away bits of their heart to their premature death. It's a decision. And so their health span is dreadful and their lifespan is also dreadful. But the key to both is what we've just been talking about. There's some other things you can do as well, but that's the real key to both, those five keys. Um, we touched on two things that I'd like to circle back to before I move on to another book that you wrote. But one of them is we talked about diabetes. And I, I know that when we were at lunch, we talked about um, supplementation and um, anti-aging drugs and uh, there's a lot of there's a huge body of work around the benefits of metformin which is a diabetes medication having positive implications on other aging related concerns and um, you know I'm not a doctor but I, I have seen an integrative uh, wellness uh, expert and I, I'm under the care of a, a doctor um, and I've been taking metformin now for about a year and a half and for me, it's been remarkably effective for a number of um, beauty, um, health, wellness, um, things that I've noticed in myself. What is your thoughts on metformin, which is a diabetes medication, as part of an anti-aging program? And also, what are some other supplements or, um, sure. that you recommend? Okay, well, first, firstly, if you look at the work of David Sinclair, who really is the world anti-aging guru, David's an Australian from the University of New South Wales, who's now moved to Harvard, and he's done all the seminal work in anti-aging. And, and I, I have a very strong interest in, in treating aging, and I think that metformin is a, a very good workhorse for not just type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes, but also the, David's doing a long study of, over, over about seven years looking at the parameters of anti-aging. The, the problem with all of this is you can't do a randomized controlled clinic, clinical trial for 50 years to see whether metformin reduce, uh, improves people's lifespan. And so what you do is you look at the other parameters of aging and, and he's found that metformin works on that. But, but it's not just metformin. Some people say, I don't want to take a drug. And th there's always side effects from drugs. So metformin is not totally harmless, but it still is a very good, safe drug for the vast majority of people. Not only does it reduce a lot of the macro and microvascular complications of diabetes, so the macrovascular complications, heart attack, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, microvascular, the kidneys, the eyes, and the peripheral nerves. So it does help there. But a lot of people don't realize this, that the people with diabetes, pre-diabetes, what we call metabolic syndrome, that are a much higher risk for obesity-related cancers. And metformin helps reduce that as well, not to mention what it does for aging. But David's also done a lot of work in the NAD space. Now, what I'm talking about, there are the revved up versions of vitamin B3. So there's a thing called nicotinamide, which doesn't have any anti-aging properties. It's not strong enough. It's one version of B3. So he's using three different 
uh, very strong NAD plus chemicals. One is NAD riboside, another one is NMN, and another one is nicotinic acid. So I personally take uh, NMN and nicotinic acid just to really rev up my mitochondria, and I'll explain what that is in a second, which gives you energy. So the mitochondria is, is the fuel pack of the cell. So it doesn't matter what sort of flash car you drive, if there's no energy in the car, it's not going to move. And it's the same, same thing with the cells of our body. The mitochondria is that, that fuel pack. And if they don't work properly, you don't have any energy in the cell. You feel tired. Your cells don't work properly. So the, the NAD derivatives, NAD riboside, NMN, nicotinic acid, drive that mitochondria and give you much more energy. So that's another, and, and that's another thing, which I'll get onto a second in a second about that. But also there's, there's ubiquinol. Ubiquinol is the active version of coenzyme Q10 that also drives the mitochondria. I use a thing called magnesium orotate. The orotate pushes up the CoQ10 levels in the mitochondria. Because when you're talking about aging, it's not just about improving energy levels. I think there are three major components. Number one is to keep your DNA repair healthy. So when you up to the age of 30, your DNA is dividing beautifully, minimal mutations, et cetera. Once you hit 30, that's when the mutations start. So just to go back to smoking for a second, every time you smoke one cigarette, and I must admit I never have in my life, but every time you smoke one cigarette, you induce at least one mutation in your lungs. So if you think about that, some people are smoking 20 to 25 cigarettes a day. There's 20 to 25 mutations. And if you do that over 20 years or so, you're getting up to about 20,000 mutations. And that's where the lung cancer starts. So 20% of smokers get lung cancer. But going back to what I was saying is that as you get older, your DNA mutates more. So every time it, it has to make a new cell. So a skin cell, for example, hangs around for around a month. And then the growth factors tell the stem cells to make more stem cells. So the, the, this, the stem cell has to divide in two to become a, another stem cell and then a skin cell. And then the DNA has to go back together. When it comes back together, often it, it, it hits the net and doesn't... Uh, doesn't work properly so you get a mutation and that gets worse as you get older which is why typically no one at 60 looks as good as they did when they were 40 and no one at 40 looks as good as they did when they were 20 because our dna repair is not so good so number one is to maintain good healthy dna repair there's this little thing called telomeres which sits at the end of of every bit of dna so a bit like the 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 little tags on your shoelaces that keep your shoelaces tight well, those telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter as we get older. So the DNA gets more frayed, just like your shoelaces get more frayed. Perfect analogy. You... That's great. And, and so you want to keep your telomeres long and your DNA repair very tight. That's number one. Number two, we've already mentioned it, which is energy. You want to give, you want to feed high quality energy into your cells. That's where the NAD derivatives come in. And number three is a thing called the senescent cells. Now, the senescent cells are basically the aging cells in your body. And some, some cells age more than other cells. And he, I make the analogy here, which I think is a good one for this. You're on a hike with a bunch of 20-year-olds up to a bunch of 80-year-olds. On that hike, the 70 to 80-year-olds will hold up the younger people. And it's the same thing with these senescent cells. They're draining more energy for metabolism than the younger, healthier cells. And so they're holding up the rest of the body. So the third component of aging is to improve the action of senescent cells to stop them draining the rest of the body. And there are things you can do in each of those spaces to improve your, your DNA repair and DNA stability and telomere length, improve your energy, which we've already mentioned, and also to improve the function of senescent cells as well. And, and so that's how I approach aging. So that I, um, launch that we were on, the Life yeah. Circulate, uh, one, uh, which was a, a supplement by Jeunesse, that had the ubiquinol in it. And yep. um, and what were the other components of that supplement? Because, I, I, you know, it was interesting that you were speaking at that event. I'm interested to know what you think is, is good about that particular supplement. The, the two key nutrients, there's a few minor nutrients which are there in smaller doses, just to really bind, bind the two key things. Number one is the ubiquinol. So that they have in their supplement, 150 milligrams a day of ubiquinol. So for me, that's what I take every day to give me energy. So 150 milligrams of ubiquinol. And they also have in it a thing called tocotrienols, which is the revved up version of vitamin E. 
So uh, around 18 years ago... So an antioxidant, a, a super uh, antioxidant. Uh, an antioxidant, but it's not just antioxidants. It's the, the stimulation of the, the immune system to give you a healthy immunity. And there's also some vascular benefits as well. So that, that's basically that, that uh, regimen. But I, I take a bucket of stuff every day as, as anti-aging, uh, to keep my joints healthy because I've, I've pulverized them from too much sport. I, I take stuff, I've got lousy sinuses, so I take stuff for that. And I just take preventative management for heart disease, cancer. I'm 65 years old. I had a coronary calcium score the other day. We should talk about that, uh, which is the best predictive test for heart disease risk. And I've had four now over the past 25 years and my coronary calcium score the other day was zero. Which, which is only 10% of men in their 60s have zero calcium scores. And, and, that, and I think that's because I've followed the five keys of being healthy and I take the supplements. In terms so, of the supplements, sorry, Dr. Ross, um, what about antioxidants and resveratrol? Again, uh, Professor David Sinclair is, you know, quite prescriptive about what he takes. Um, yeah. And, you know, I follow it as well. And we had a great conversation around that but what about resveratrol for its tout being touted as like a super antioxidant yeah look resveratrol is pretty good i don't have any problems with that but i, I think the the question with all of this is how much is enough so in my view and, and i'm extremely biased because i do all the research with the italians on this product the best natural product in the world is a thing called bpf 99 which comes from the bergamot orange grown in southern calabria and, and I, as I said, I've published about 20 papers with my colleagues in Italy on this very subject. And that, that has very, very strong polyphenols or plant chemicals that work as antioxidants, that work as what we call second messengers in the cells to improve the metabolism of the cell. There's a thing called AMP kinase, which is the master metabolic switch. And that, so that controls glucose, fat, and protein metabolism. It controls the blood flow to your head. And, and we've got published data that this, these bergamot derivatives uh, reduce, will improve your cholesterol, reduce your risk for diabetes, reduce your risk for fatty liver, as I said, improve blood flow to the, the head. Some work from the University of Manchester, not our lab in Italy, showed that, that the bergamot derivatives suppress cancer stem cells through the antioxidant me mechanism and also the mechanism of just improving metabolism. So, so that's something that I take, uh, I've been taking for 15 years and I certainly take it every day as well. So it's not just one thing. I, I think it's, it's a bit like when you eat an apple, which is very good for you, or eat an orange, you don't eat, eat one chemical in the orange, you eat the whole orange, the whole apple. So I take a, a program of vitamins and antioxidant supplements uh, to to complement to supplement my healthy lifestyle and and it and that's the important thing it's they're called supplements they are not replacements you still have to put in the hard yards with every other aspect those five keys to get the real benefits for anti aging. Um, Dr. Walker, uh, we talked you touched on and I definitely want to speak about this because I think it it's such a you know big moment in time. When Shane Warne died and they said it was from a heart attack, I think it set a sh an electrical shock to every middle-aged man in Australia, uh, well, but first... also to middle-aged women, because if your partner is a middle-aged man and, you know, he's supposedly fit and just le leading a normal Aussie lifestyle, to have, uh, you know, someone who um, the media is uh, eulogised as an icon and, you know, um, so important to us culturally drop dead on a holiday in Thailand is pretty horrific and a stark reminder of our need for testing, our need mm. for awareness around our heart health, and also yep. the limitations of our bodies. Um, yep. you, you touched on testing. I'm interested to know your thoughts on what are some non-invasive tests that everybody over the age of 40 needs to invest in? Well, before that, can we just go back to these three serious, uh, three prominent deaths we've had in the last couple of weeks? The death of Rod Marsh, who was in his 70s, but the death of Shane Warne and Kimberly Kitching, the Labor Centre, the well-respected Labor Centre. Yes, Center. absolutely, yes. Both, both of them died at 52, both of them. And 52 is not, not old. That's a young age. But let's look at Shane's case, then I'll talk about how it could have been prevented. Um, firstly, Shane was a heavy smoker through most of his life. I don't know if, if he was smoking at the time of his death, 
but he would, I, I've spoken to people who knew him very well. I'd never actually met him. His parents were friend of, friends of mine, but I, I'd ne- not actually met Shane. But he, he smoked up to 50, 60 cigarettes a day. He's incredibly heavy smoke. Well, I had we, met him and he was definitely smoking when I met him. Yeah, and, and it looks, in my view, come the revolution, I'm running the show, cigarettes would be banned. They just shouldn't be sold. They, they should, they're, to me, they're a legal pro- product. I'd make them illegal. They should be banned. But, but that, so that's the first point. He was a heavy smoker. The second point, he had a dreadful diet. And, and the other thing was that he also went on to one of these detox diets. And, and when, when people want to lose weight rapidly, that's okay in your 20s and 30s. But once you get beyond 40, your metabolism's changed. If you've got a bit of abdominal obesity and you want to shed that quickly, what happens? And, and the abdominal obesity isn't just an ugly lump of lard. It's a toxic reservoir that's held on to all of the dreadful chemicals we've been exposed to over the years. We were designed to walk around that jungle no synthetic chemicals at all, but we get exposed to heavy metals, to plastics, to dioxins, a whole lot of rubbish. And that sits in our abdominal fat in an inert state doing nothing. But then if you lose it quickly, not slowly, lose it quickly, you're pouring all this stuff into your central circulation. Wow. Over- okay. the that, art- is it. that is the first time I've heard it explained that way. And it can make the plaques rupture. So if you imagine a plaque, there's a, a donut with a hole in it. That's where the blood's going but all the fat sitting in the wall dormant until you stir it up. And I want to get onto that in a second, because that's really important. You stir it up, then it goes. Boom. So a heart attack isn't a slow blockage. It's a sudden rupture. And there's always a stress precipitant that ruptures that. That stress could be emotional stress. It could be mental stress. It could be physical stress. It could be pharmacologic stress. So, I, for example, I had a guy in his 30s. Uh, with a strong family history of heart disease, went out one night on a Bucks party, had a few lines of Coke, major heart attack, wiped out half his heart. And it can be in this pandemic era, an infective stress. So what I'm saying with Shane, he had pain, allegedly, in the week or two before he died. So instead of going to a hospital and having a stent or a bypass, he goes to Thailand. So is it a shock that Shane Warne died? Not in the slightest. Is it a tragedy? Of course it is. It's a tragedy when anyone dies. And Shane was the best leg spinner or the best spinner, spin bowler the world has ever seen. The man was a freak on the cricket field, but he didn't look after himself and he did not get his chest pain addressed. And he went on to a fad diet, which I think is dangerous over the age of 40. So when, if anyone wants to lose weight, they should do it slowly, not like that. Kimberly Kitching is another one. Allegedly, she was under an enormous amount of stress from bullying within her party. Now, I'm not suggesting this only happens in the Labor Party. I don't want to get political here at all. But regardless, allegedly, she was under an enormous amount of stress. So uh, in 40 years of practicing medicine, I've never seen one person who had a heart attack, stroke, stent, bypass, sudden death, who wasn't under one of those five forms of stress at the time. So what do we do about it? That's the question you ask. You wrote in your book, uh, it was um, the health, your second book, sorry, I can't remember the name of it, about anger, stress, sadness. Yeah, the life factor, yeah. The life factor, that's right, yes. So, So, for example, anger. Within two hours of you getting acutely angry with anyone, you increase your risk for a heart attack eight times. Within two hours of you getting anxious about anything, eight times increased risk for heart disease. That's the emotional stress. Then there's mental stress. There was a study of, of, I think it was around 20,000 British civil servants called the Whitehall study. It has been going on for about 30 years now. And it showed that those who are under job strain, which is high demand, low control. So it's the middle managers, not the bosses. They were the ones who had much higher cardiovascular disease and, and high blood pressure. That's mental stress. Extremes of physical stress. I had a man in his late 70s who thought it was a good idea on a 40 degree Celsius day to play singles tennis, ended up with a stent in his arteries. And you see, I had a, and then there's pharmacologic stress. I've already mentioned the cocaine, but I had a fellow uh, in his 30s who thought it was a good idea to have three double shot cappuccinos in the space of an hour. And he sent his heart into overdrive. So, so it's all of these stressors bring it on. So getting back when, to what you were Sorry, I'll interrupt. I'll circle back to emotional stress because, um, you know, we were talking about the pandemic at lunch and it's still very omnipresent. Um, yep. But the emotional stress of 
of what we've talked about, seen, um, endured over the past couple of years, coupled with the in enormous toll it's taken on personal relationships. You know, a lot of people are talking about the non-medical factors of having lived through a pandemic and now this crazy news cycle that we're constantly being fed a steady diet of stress and then the relationship breakdowns as a result of the lockdowns and the pandemic you know as in your view as an integrative cardiologist what are the lifespan health span and I guess the physiological impact of that kind of stress oh, it's it's ridiculously bad and and I think that the fact that uh, let's put this in perspective. In 2020, COVID, <coughs> excuse me, in Australia was the 38th leading cause of death, 38th. So I said at the start of the pandemic in 2020 on Channel 7, if everyone's that concerned about their health and security, stop stockpiling toilet paper, but stockpile fruit and vegetables and exercise equipment because one person dies every 20 minutes in this country from cardiovascular disease. So we, we've lost the perspective We've shut society down from a, a virus that I'm not playing it down. COVID has killed people. There is no doubt about that. COVID loves the very old, the very sick and the very fat. They're the main people who are getting very ill from COVID. But even then, sometimes younger people with no risk factors at all can still get very ill from COVID. So I'm not playing it down as a condition. But a lot of people don't realise this, that 5% of hospital admissions during non-COVID times are due to the common cold. 10% of pneumonias are due to the common cold. And we didn't hear five years ago once in the media, or oh, it's dreadful, there's been 30,000 cases of the common cold in New South Wales to this, this week. We, we, we didn't hear that because it was happening, but just no one, no one thought about it. We just got on with our lives. And the problem is, as you say, the enormous psychological effect from from the relationship breakdowns, from being isolated or, or the I mean, you literally see people age overnight from a you know, from a divorce or the death of a partner, you you do see that, like the the physical imprint of that kind of stress is exactly as you say. Oh, it's, it's dreadful, and also the loss of business. So a lot of people's business have gone have gone belly up during during COVID. There are so many things that have gone wrong. So has the government managed it well? No. Have they managed it badly? No. They've been okay, in my view. I would have done it completely differently, but that's you know that, that's with hindsight, and I've been saying this for two years on my radio show and on television, that I think there are other ways we could have done this, and I think society would have survived just as well and probably even better because of all of the, as you say, spin-off mental health effects from, from COVID, the, the, the fact that people weren't getting their breast checks or their cardiac checks. So people were dying from other conditions more so than they were dying from COVID. So, so it, it's just, it, it's such a devastating effect. And, and people have to realise that, for example, the best thing, the most selfish thing you can do for your own health is to love your partner. And, and, and that, that is a much stronger message than lowering your damn cholesterol with a pill. And that's what really annoys me, that there's a wonderful saying, climbing the ladder to success to find you're on the wrong damn wall. And the wrong, <laughs> and the wrong damn wall is just focusing on something that's clearly not as important as, as just your overall, the five keys of being healthy, which is where we should be putting our focus. So what are the tests that we can have that are non-invasive? Because when people speak about cardiovascular health or colon health or liver health, a lot of the testing procedures or even ovarian cancer, it, yep. people are, it's the testing that doesn't happen because it can be quite invasive. It can be scary. Are there some non-scary, non-invasive tests that you recommend? In 1999, I introduced into Australia in conjunction with the Sydney Adventist Hospital at Warunga a test called coronary calcium scoring. It's a CT scanner that takes a snapshot of your arteries. No dye, no injections. Now, there's a, a test done on the same technology called a CT angiogram that gives you beautiful pictures of your arteries. But that's but the one that you have to inject, right? Yeah, and it doesn't give you any, any more predictive benefit over the coronary calcium score. So the difference is that the CT angiogram makes your wallet $500 lighter. You glow in the dark for three days afterwards because it's a lot of radiation, which probably doesn't matter over the age of 50, but it certainly does matter if you're below the age of 50. 
and you're given an intravenous injection that you can have an anaphylactic reaction to, or it may damage your kidneys. Now, again, most people get away with that test, but there's no point having it because the coronary calcium score has been shown to be a better predictor than the CT angiogram, even though the CT angiogram gives you prettier pictures. So is this so, something that we would ask our cardiologist or our GP for? Yeah, because, GP, because, GP. yeah. So, so, so basically... Uh, when, when a male hits around 45 to 50, they should be having the coronary calcium score. When a female hits 55 to 60, they should be having the coronary calcium score. What's the difference? The difference is women are typically protected by their hormones uh, until about age 50. But in the case of Kimberly Kitching, if indeed she did die of an atherosclerotic heart disease, which is what you're, you're looking for, the buildup of fat in the wall, the arteries with the calcium score, if that's what she died from, she already had the disease in her 50s and the stress just precipitated the disease, didn't cause it. The genes caused it, but the stress, so the genes loads the gun, then the environment pulls, pulled the trigger in her case. So have the calcium score. So for example, just say a young woman like you, so you're, you're in your early thirties, of course. Um, so, <laughs> I'm 48. Yeah, well, okay, well, but just say at 48, you said to me, my dad had a bypass at 40. Which I'd be he doing, did. Which he did. Well I'd, well, I'd be doing the coronary calcium score on you right now because you still have that genetic abnormality that you need to have detected. If your calcium score is zero, you're very reassured. You don't need to worry about your cholesterol or anything else. But if you already had muck in your arteries, I'll, I'll give you a great example. I had a 32 year old woman whose father died at 31 of a heart attack. Her cholesterol was 12.4, which is just off the scale. So I set her downstairs. I've got a CT scanner under my office. It's not mine, but the, the radiology practice is there. Um, we, we did a coronary calcium score on her. It was already 48. Now, anything below 100 is only mild, but for a 32-year-old, 48 is a huge amount of muck in her arteries already. So I'm hammering her with a statin drug to lower her cholesterol because she will probably die from the condition or have a major heart attack if we don't get that cholesterol lower. And her cholesterol is genetic. All people think, oh, cholesterol is to do with food. No, it's not. It's genetic and metabolic. So as we all get older, go through menopause, up goes the cholesterol. That's just called your metabolism. So part of the conversation that I have um, and, and the research that I'm doing for the Ageless platform around testing is um, genetic testing. I had genetic testing for the first time, I want to say about 13 years ago with 23andMe. And I've since had an updated genetic testing with a company called DNA Power over in Canada. And what I loved about that test is that they made fantastic lifestyle, health, diet, exercise um, recommendations that would overlay, you know, my genetic predisposition, which thank God was uh, really good uh, to all of the major aging diseases, and then overlay it with changes that I can make so my epigenetics could come into play and, and help improve my yeah. longevity and also my health. Um, yeah. So we talked about um, the cardiovascular testing. What, what are you, and you touched on then genetics and then the lifestyle factors. What are your thoughts on what's fixed with our genetics and the role of epigenetics in changing our destiny? Right. Well, firstly, just before I get into that, just can I say, calcium score is one thing, appropriate blood tests are another, because you mentioned genetics. 70% of heart disease is due to insulin resistance, which is the gene that occurs in 30% of Caucasians, 50% of Asians, and 100% of people with darker skin. And that sets you up for diabetes, blood pressure, high triglyceride, low HDL in your cholesterol, fat around the belly, and then all the things, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 20% is due to lipoprotein little a. And lipoprotein delay occurs in one in five people, markedly increases your risk for heart disease. So therefore, two genes explains 90% of heart disease, two genes. And there are other, other less common genes that do it as well. So certainly have your calcium score, have appropriate blood testing. And I think we're moving now into the, into the genetic space. So I think that that's the way we should be approaching screening for heart disease. Now, your question was that I... So my question was um, the role of fixed genetics once oh, yeah, we yeah, find I... out what our destiny is by, by the genetic coding and then what the epigenetic overlay is to redirect Perfect. our destiny. Perfect question. 
just to give a quick genetics 101 explanation, we have, all of us have about 26,000 genes in our body. And the way genes work, you get one copy of a gene from mum, one copy from dad. So there's only three possibilities with each gene. Two good genes, a good and bad gene, or two bad genes. And that's the mix everyone gets. So I've got families where there are five children, three have severe heart disease, two don't. Because just because of that mix of genes, just a coin toss on each gene. But then... A lot of people don't realize this, that one DNA molecule has 3 billion chemical pairs. And if you string it out, it's two meters long. It's got to be bent, turned and twisted into a little dot you can't see with your naked eye. That's how small DNA is. And the, the problem is with those genes, less than 5% of genes are fixed. So what makes you look like you and me look like me and you a woman, me a, me a man, they're fixed genes. We can't do a thing about that. OK, but 95 percent of genes are either activated or inactivated. So it's not my genes cause my problem. It's typically five percent of my genes make me who I am. But then the other 95 percent are affected by the environment. That's where epigenetics comes in. So it's environmental stimuli affecting DNA, then affecting RNA, then making proteins. So, for example, if you go through an intense piece of stress in your life, you then activate a set of genes that were dormant before that then make all of these proteins that then can upset your biochemistry. So for example, one of the big things in weight gain is cortisone from stress. So we have two unhappy chemicals, adrenaline and cortisone. When you're under acute stress, it's mainly adrenaline. When you're under chronic stress, it's mainly cortisone. Now cortisone not only weakens your blood vessels, but it also deposits fat around your belly. So people who are under enormous stress tend to put on weight around the belly. But and that's that what is, they call visceral fat. And that's the thing that you were yeah. saying, you don't want to blast in a quick fad diet. You want to slowly uh, reduce that. Yeah, yeah, but, but and the see, metformin addresses that as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. But what I'm saying is that the, the stressors then promote this protein that then promotes cortisol. And, and so that's an epigenetic mechanism, which then promotes weight gain. And that's why it's so important that, that what you said, what you've been saying all the way, we've got to learn to manage our stresses better because our stresses then affect our DNA, which then affects our proteins, which then lays down fat and all the other problems. So, so we don't just get uh, mental health issues from it. We get physical health issues from the effect of stressors. And it doesn't have to be just emotional stress. It can be uh, physical toxins in the environment. And people don't realize this, for example, it, these people are always sucking on, on, bottled water out of plastic bottles, there, there's something like four to 500 microchemicals that leach into the water. And people will often use those bottles, reuse those bottles all the time, leave them in their car, they get hot, more, more chemicals leach into the plastic. So that's more environmental stimuli, You're having this epigenetic mechanism on everything. So your comments about epigenetics are just so important. And well, so it's important. everything you've been saying and every, everything that you've had in your book is about redirecting epigenetics, I guess. Absolutely. And, and so people, we're not the victims of our genes. We're the masters of our genes. So we can That's control... That's good news. That's very good news. Well, we're 95%. We can control 95% of our genes, 95% by, by what we, we're putting into our system in all ways, whether it's emotional or physical or mental, it doesn't matter. So we're affecting our genes. That's where it's so important. Dr. Ross, to finish, I want to ask you, uh, kind of in a continuation of our lunch conversation, um, how far away do you think we are on developing anti-aging medication, like proper drugs or uh, a course of supplements that will really impact uh, cellular wellness, regeneration, rejuvenation, that's both for inside and out? I think that we're already there. I think we already have them. So we have now... Very good. So, for example, there's a very exciting new supplement called Hobamine that maintains DNA repair. So, so we've got that. We've, What's that called again? Hobamine. Hobamine. H O B A M I N E. And and so I take a supplement every day that has this in it. I have a take the NMN and, and nicotinic acid, and also there's a thing called fisetin that that improves this the the health of the sen, uh, senolytics or senolytic breakdown the senescent cells. So I think we already have the supplements and the work, work of, of geniuses like David Sinclair will only make this better as time goes on. But I already think we have the stuff. 
we already have the armamentarium to to improve our aging because if you can treat aging so dave sinclair says aging is a disease it's a d- disease that can be detected it's a disease that can be treated and managed and so reversed you, and, and reversed reverse. yeah so if you treat aging at that level treat dna repair give your cells more energy break down those senescent cells and stop them from from feeding off the rest of the body. If you do that, and we already have the the facilities to do that now, we can then stop the next level, which is the aging cells then degenerating into heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis. It's already there for people to do, but it just requires discipline and effort by firstly keeping your lifestyle tight and then the discipline of swallowing some supplements every day. It's not difficult, but it just requires effort. Well, it was an absolute joy and pleasure to have you on the show. I'm so inspired and um, by all, not just inspired by the conversation, but also the practical and positive um, conversation that we've had, that there are so many things that are absolutely in our hands. And I always like to, with the magazine and with the podcast and with everything that we're doing on Ageless, is to say that there are indeed so many solutions currently available. Most of them are free. Um and so I think you've really reinforced that for me and certainly I hope for, for whoever's listening or watching this episode with us. But uh, Dr. Ross Walker, thank you so much for being on Ageless by Rescue. My absolute pleasure, Baha. Thank you for having me on. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please share and rate this episode. I'd love that.